Number 10, treadmill punishment. While getting on a treadmill today can feel like a punishment in itself, back in the Victorian era, prisoners were assigned to the treadmill as a real punishment. Yeah, you can't get off this one. You would think they're only making prisoners stronger, but there is a method behind this madness. Listen up. The treadmill was invented by Sir William Cubitt in 1818. The treadmill was used not only for grinding corn, but mainly as a punishment. Corn and punishments, my two favorite things. Prisoners would step on 24 spokes of a large paddle wheel, causing it to turn. While originally intended for productive work, it quickly became a form of punishment. Yeah, somebody saw it and was like, you know what? I know how to make this awful. Get on there. The repetitive physical strain of the treadmill made it one of the most dreaded among inmates. Just thinking about a treadmill right now is making my legs shake. Let's move on. Number nine, Amelia Dyer. During the Victorian era, rapid industrialization led to urban expansion, bringing with it increased disease, poverty, and unemployment. All those fun things that make a city. By 1856, the force had expanded to include inspectors tasked with investigating serious crimes. One notable event occurred in 1896 when reading detectives apprehended Amelia Dyer. She was convicted of multiple killings, the worst of the worst, the details of which I can't even say on YouTube or else our channel will get shut down. But the number of lives Amelia Dyer has taken, historians believe that number is around 400. 400, and a lot of them are quite young, by the way. Quite young. If it weren't for the Reading Borough Police Force and that small team of officers, who knows how many more lives would have been lost by the hands of one Amelia Dyer. Eight, transportation. In the 1800s, courts were looking for alternatives to hanging that were harsher than fines, but not as brutal as well, being hanged. Transportation then emerged as a viable punitive option. Initiated in 1717, this practice involved sending convicts away, just sending them away to colonies, primarily in Australia at the time, where over 165,000 were transported over 80 years. Now, initially, convicts were housed on decrepit warships with a high mortality rate, of course, due to unsanitary conditions, but the majority of those transported were male, ranging from quite young, again, very young, to individuals that were over 80. It could be anyone, these boats were crazy. The journey often included stops in Gibraltar, the West Indies, South America, or the Cape of Good Hope to resupply provisions before reaching various Australian settlements. To which they go, you, get out. Okay, let's do it. Number seven, the crank. Oh, the crank, it sounds easy but you give it time. Prisoners often endured hard labor, such as breaking stones or turning the crank machine, which was a handle that convicts had to turn thousands of times a day, and often for no purpose other than punishment. Yeah, it's like a wheel that'll, uh, not a wheel, it's like a, <laughs> this is a blooper, me going, it's like a, it's a, it's, yeah, come on, come on. it's like those old cars where you had to roll the window down manually. It took you like seven and a half minutes. You're like, come on, I'm so hot. There we go, we found it. An example is the case of Oscar Wilde, who was sentenced to two years of hard labor for gross indecency. Now his prison experience, especially the hard labor, drastically affected his health and literary productivity. So far, this one here sounds the worst. At least with the treadmill, you got a little bit stronger over time, there's some sort of payoff. But turning a crank for no reason at all, I mean, maybe your one arm would get jacked, but other than that, you're just gonna destroy your body for no reason at all. What a nightmare. The Scold's Bridle was a sinister instrument of public humiliation from the Victorian era. Now this one, this one really sucked. I'm not gonna lie, we're gonna start cranking it up here. No pun intended. The device was used to punish unruly women who were accused of nagging or gossiping. Yeah, you talk to your friend, now you got the Scold's Bridle, enjoy. The Scold's Bridle resembled an iron cage almost. The bridle enclosed the head of the accused, while some versions featured a spiked or studded plate that was inserted into the mouth to suppress speech and causing, of course, excruciating pain. And if the wearer attempted to continue to gossip or talk. They were often paraded through the streets and the victim was subjected to public ridicule and scorn. Yeah, scorn, you ever been scorned before? That sucks. Turning the Scold's Bridle into a dreadful symbol of enforced silence and and societal control over women's voices and opinions. This one looks like a saw trap too. This was pretty brutal. It should have been number one, if anything. Number five, solitary confinement. You're grounded. And I really mean you're grounded. In the Victorian era, solitary confinement was a widely utilized form of punishment that embodied the period's harsh philosophy. Yeah, we're not cranking things. This time we're just, we're just thinking about our problems. 
It was known originally as the separate system, and it was designed to isolate prisoners to reflect on their crimes and ideally reform. Rather, they just went absolutely insane. Inmates were confined in small, stark cells, cut off from all human contact and external stimuli. No sunlight, no hope, nothing. The silence and isolation were intended to prevent the corruption associated with the prisoner interaction and, of course, encourage penitence, right? You want to want to behave, of course. However, this extreme isolation often led to severe psychological effects, if anything, including mental breakdowns. I'd have a breakdown on day two, are you kidding me? I thought getting grounded as a kid was bad, but at least then I could see the sun, so not half bad considering what it used to be. Number four, branding. Now we're cooking. Branding was a brutal form of punishment often reserved for criminals convicted of the gravest offenses. I mean, obviously you're getting your ass I would assume it's pretty bad. This punitive practice involved searing the skin of the convicted individual with a hot iron, typically marking them with a letter symbolizing their crime. So for instance, T for thief or M for murder. Performed publicly or within prison walls, branding was not only excruciatingly painful, but also served as a lifelong stigma because, well, that's not going anywhere. That's going to be there for life. It would permanently mark individuals as criminals and ostracize them from society. By the mid-19th century, this barbaric practice was thankfully phased out. Imagine if Victorians could see the movie Jackass 2. I wonder what they'd think of Bam Margera getting paid to be branded. Oh, how the times have changed. My God. Number three, public whipping. Public whipping was sadly a common measure in the Victorian era. It was a harsh and humiliating form of punishment. It was administered with a whip or, if you were really bad, a cat o' nine tails, which was a multi-tailed whip that inflicted severe pain. This punishment was often carried out in public squares to serve as a deterrent to others. Ideally, you'd look at them and go, wow, that's horrible. I'm never gonna steal bread, let's go home and then Bob's your uncle. The convicted person was typically tied to a whipping post, stripped to the waist, and then lashed a specific number of times, depending on the severity of said crime. The physical scars were complemented by the stigma of having been punished in full view of the community. Over time, as societal attitudes towards corporal punishment shifted, thankfully public whipping was increasingly seen as barbaric and was largely abolished by the end of the 19th century. Number two, the pillory and stocks. The pillory and stocks were prominent tools of public humiliation and shame. The pillory involved securing a person's head and hands in a wooden frame. You've probably seen this in any medieval times or whatever. They were usually elevated while stocks immobilized the offender's feet and sometimes their hand at ground level. Quite uncomfortable. Positioned in public squares, obviously, these devices exposed individuals to the ridicule and abuse of passerbyers who often hurled rotten food, mud, and verbal insults at you while you were just stuck there watching the whole thing. POV. Utilized for crimes such as petty theft, slander, and disorderly conduct, these punishments aimed not to only deter the offender, but also serve as a stark warning to the community as they're hucking mud pies at you, I guess. This one would suck. Everyone waits until your hands are locked up and now they want to talk, tell you how they feel. What a horrible time. I'd keep track of who's doing it and be like, okay, I'm coming back for you, sir. Number one, hanging. During the Victorian era, hanging was the ultimate form of capital punishment, reserved for the most serious offenses, such as treason and burglary, or of course, just killing another person. That'll, that'll probably do it. The execution was a public spectacle intended to deter criminal behavior within the community. Now, typically conducted at public gallows, the condemned person was dropped from a platform to ideally break the neck swiftly, though sometimes death by strangulation occurred, prolonging the suffering. That would be the worst. My long neck, I'd be, I'd be screwed. That would be, that'd be two bricks right there. Famous individuals who met their end by hanging include Catherine Wilson, who was suspected of multiple poisonings and then later hanged in 1862, and William Palmer, the notorious Ruggily Poisoner, was hanged in 1856. And everyone watched and just ate their lunch like it was UFC. They're like, oh, this is fun to watch. Bring the kids. Sure, why not? Over time, public executions were moved behind prison walls to quell the spectacle and growing distaste among the populace. I think if I had to pick any of these, I would do the pillory and stocks. Again, I would keep track of every neighbor who was talking shit. Once these unlocked, I'm going right for you. Throwing those mud pies at me, get lost. Starting off today, we are diving into the world of mental asylums. Mental asylums during the Victorian era are definitely not your modern day rehab center. These places were like the catch all bucket for anyone society didn't quite know how to handle. Not just for those grappling with mental illness, but also for people who just didn't fit the very tight Victorian mold. Got a rebellious streak or just too loud for your neighbor's liking. You might just find yourself locked up 
in one of these gloomy asylums. And let me tell you, the conditions were nothing short of nightmarish. We're talking about overcrowding, minimal if any real mental health treatment, and methods of confinement that could make even the sanest person question their sanity. It was less about healing and more about hiding away the problematic ones out of society's sight. Imagine being treated more like a prisoner in a dungeon than a patient in a hospital. That was the harsh reality of Victorian mental asylums. Next up on our list today, we have Pen Fort A Dur. Imagine being accused of a crime in the not so good old days, and there you are, stubbornly refusing to plead guilty or not guilty because you know the system is rigged. Enter the nightmare fuel of the medieval world. This gruesome punishment method was something straight out of a horror flick. The accused would be laid flat and a board would be placed on top of their chest. Then stones, cold, heavy stones are piled onto the board one by one. The weight increases, the breathing gets harder, and why endure such torture? It's all because of a loophole. By not pleading guilty or not guilty, the accused could avoid a formal trial, which meant even if they died under the weight, their family could still inherit their stuff. It was a brutal, desperate gamble. Though officially scrapped just before the Victorian era kicked in, the sheer horror of this punishment lingered in the public memory, kind of like the ghost of punishment's past, whispering, be glad you live in the now. Next up, we are journeying over to the gibbet. The gibbet, or gibbeting, was like a horror movie of old school punishments. So picture this. After the execution took place, the criminal wasn't just buried and forgotten about. Nope, that would just be too easy, I guess. Their body instead was sometimes locked up in an iron cage and hung from a tall frame called a gibbet, kind of like a creepy bird cage, but for humans. This wasn't tucked away in some dark corner either, it was of course out in the open where everyone could see it. The body was left to hang there, decomposing in the open air, come rain or shine. Why the public display? Well, it was all about scare tactics. The sight of a swinging, decaying corpse was supposed to frighten anyone from thinking about breaking the law. Fair enough. It was a very stark, gruesome reminder plastered right in the town square. Break the law and you could be the next ghastly attraction. Yikes. Talk about a deterrent. I don't think I'd commit any crime after that, actually. It's crazy. <laughs> Even just like, uh, scared straight or whatever that show is. Like, that was enough for me. <laughs> Just a real dead body hanging in the middle of the town square. So scary. Okay. I don't think I'd do well in the Victorian era, but I guess they wouldn't do well now. Imagine showing like TikTok to a Victorian child. Next up on our list today, we are talking about hulks. Before dedicated prisons became widespread, hulks were a common form of punishment. At first, hulks sounds more like something from like a pirate adventure than real life, but trust me, it was far from a swashbuckling good time. Before the days of modern prisons, these old creaky warships, stripped of their glory and no longer seaworthy, were anchored permanently in harbors to house prisoners. Imagine being crammed into the dank, dark belly of a decommissioned ship with scores of other unfortunate souls. Conditions on these floating prisons were nothing short of nightmarish. They were overcrowded, they were festering with disease, and the air was thick with despair. Prisoners were often put to back-breaking work during the day, maybe hammering away at ship breaking or toiling in nearby docks or riverbanks, and life on a hull was just a grim, a slow, and a steady descent into misery, making it one of the punishments from the past that was as much about enduring harsh conditions as it was about serving time. Next up on our list today, we have shame. Public humiliation was a go-to tactic in the punishment playbook during the Victorian era and honestly even before that. Imagine being caught for a petty theft or a public nuisance and instead of just serving time or getting a ticket, you're slapped with a giant sign spelling out your crime and then you are paraded around town. Or perhaps you'll find yourself locked in the stocks, stuck in one uncomfortable position in the town square. Here, everyone from cheeky kids to stern old timers could get a good look at you, and they didn't just stare. 
Oh, of course not. They jeered, they tossed rotten tomatoes, or worse, sometimes. It wasn't just about making you rethink your life choices, it was about showing everyone else what could happen if they stepped out of line. This kind of punishment turned lawbreakers into live lessons in morality, with a side of entertainment Victorian style. Kinda makes you glad that all you get is a parking ticket these days, right? I'm just saying, alright? Put that in the gratitude journal this morning. Next up on our list today, we have the drunkard's cloak. Speaking of shame, this was one method that definitely worked to embarrass anyone out of committing this crime, and it also showed that maybe the Victorians had a bit of a sense of humor, although a very morbid one. So imagine you're in a bustling town square, and there's someone looking quite ridiculous and moving awkwardly among the crowd. This poor soul is decked out in the infamous drunkard's cloak, which is basically a barrel turned into a heavy, uncomfortable garment. Think of it as the original cone of shame, but for humans. This barrel, often with holes for the arms and head, turned public drunks into walking spectacles. Walking around in this bulky, clunky barrel made any movement a challenge and attracted all kinds of stares, snickers, and maybe even a few rotten tomatoes from onlookers. This cloak wasn't just a punishment, it was a public statement. I partied too hard, and look where it got me. Designed to shame the wearer and entertain the public, the drunkard's cloak was a bizarre blend of punishment and street theater. So next time you're thinking about overdoing it at happy hour, just be thankful you're not doing so in a time when the hangover could involve navigating the local market in a barrel. That would be horrible. Next up on our list, we have the silent system. Imagine stepping into a Victorian era prison and hearing absolutely nothing. That would be so creepy, right? And that is the silent system for you. Introduced as a shiny new way to keep prisoners from corrupting each other with their criminal chatter, this system took solitary confinement up a notch. Inmates were not only isolated, but were also required to remain completely silent. The idea was that the silence would help them reflect on their crimes and reform. Sounds noble in theory maybe, but in practice it was a lot more like psychological torture. The utter lack of conversation, the inability to express any thoughts or feelings, often drove prisoners to the brink of madness. This eerie quiet was intended to cleanse their moral palate, but instead it often led to severe mental breakdowns. Talk about a punishment that leaves you speechless, literally and figuratively. Next up we are talking about the body. So imagine being punished for a brutal crime, only to have your punishment punishment last into and after your death. It sounds kind of extreme. Right? Well, back in the Victorian era for some particularly nasty crimes, the punishment didn't just stop with their last breath. Nope, back in the day. The justice system had a bit of a flair for the dramatic and the downright macabre. So after the execution, they might prop up the criminal's body for all to see, turning it into a public spectacle. Talked about this a little bit. Thinking of it as a chilling warning sign, like behave or this could be you. But wait, it gets even more gruesome. Sometimes they'd even dissect the body. Yeah, I don't know why. They'd slice it open, pull it apart, often in front of an audience. This wasn't just for science, it was showbiz, Victorian style. It was like their way of saying the law had not only the power to take your life, but also to command your body after death. A reminder that the justice system held all the cards, making sure the memory of your deeds lived on as a lesson for everyone else. Next up on our list, we are talking about the shot drill. Okay, so you're in a Victorian era prison yard and there's no gym, but there's plenty of what you might call forced fitness. Enter the shot drill, a grueling exercise that could make even the toughest gym class look like an absolute walk in the park. Imagine lugging a hefty cannonball, hoisting it up to your chest with both hands, and then shuffling across the prison yard to drop it off at the other end. Sounds pretty tough, right? So now picture doing that just over and over again, from sun up to sundown. This wasn't just about keeping prisoners busy or whatever, it was back breaking work meant to drain their energy and break their spirits. The shot drill was the Victorian penal system's way of adding insult to injury, keeping you physically exhausted and constantly reminded of your captive state. Talk about a heavy day's work. Imagine doing all of that, so you gotta do all of those drills with the can with a cannonball also, like we had nothing else, and then you gotta go inside and just be quiet after that. <laughs> you just can't talk at all. That would just suck. Okay, I don't 
don't know, man. I really don't think I would have done well in the Victorian era. Okay, and finally on our list today, we have oakum picking. So imagine, again, you're a prisoner in the Victorian era, sentenced to oakum picking. Sounds like something kind of out of a craft fair, but uh, way better than that shot drill sentence. Well, maybe not quite. Imagine sitting there day after day, tearing apart old tar-soaked ropes that used to hold ships together. Your task is to pull these gritty, sticky ropes apart until all that's left are the fibers, which then get reused to plug up leaks in ships or stuff the very mattress you might be sleeping on, if you can call it sleeping. This isn't just tough on the mind, it is brutal on the hands. As you separate these fibers, your hands start to cramp, ache, and even bleed thanks to the relentless, jagged edges of the rope. And just when you think you can't take another minute, you realize that your shift is not even close to being over. Oakum picking isn't just a job, it's a test of endurance, turning each day into a gritty battle against ropes that seem as tough tough as the life you are trying to survive. Alrighty, let's dive into the grim yet fascinating world of Victorian era hangings with a bit of a casual twist. Imagine a time when Netflix wasn't around and people needed some form of entertainment. Gruesome as it may sound, public hangings were kind of like the morbid blockbusters of the Victorian era. Now, hanging wasn't just a drop in the park, it was a go-to showstopper for very serious crimes. Think of it as the ultimate deterrent, a stark warning that crime doesn't pay, especially not in an era where stealing a loaf of bread could land you in a world of trouble. It went a little something like this. A town crier announces the upcoming execution. I would and love to be a town crier. Oh my god. Those guys had all the tea. <laughs> Just going and yelling at everybody. Oh sh I really wanted to do a town crier impersonation, but I just can't yell in here. Chris's ears would explode. A town crier announces the upcoming execution. Flyers are posted and word spreads like wildfire. On the big day, people flock from far and wide, creating a carnival-like atmosphere. There are vendors selling snacks, folks jostling for the best view, and an air of anticipation that's hard to miss. The condemned, often paraded through the streets, would then face their final curtain on the gallows, a platform designed for the very purpose of ending lives. The executioner, sometimes hooded, would place the rope around the prisoner's neck, a process watched with bated breath by the crowd. A quick pull of the lever, and it was all over. But here's a twist in the tale. Public executions weren't just about punishment, they were also seen as moral lessons. Live action morality plays meant to instill fear and promote good behavior. Yet the spectacle sometimes backfired. Sympathies occasionally swayed towards the unfortunate soul on the gallows, especially if the crowd deemed their crime petty or their behavior sympathetic. By 1868, Britain decided this was all a bit too much for public sensibilities and moved executions behind the solemn walls of prisons, away from the public's prying eyes and picnics. So next time you're queuing for the latest movie or binge watching a series, spare a thought for the Victorians, for whom a day out might have just involved a bit of gallows theater, complete with real life drama, tragedy, and unfortunately, no encore for the star of the show. Ooh. All right, next up on our list, we have flogging. Spare the rod and spoil the child. If you've heard this phrase before, imagine it being taken to the extreme, as they often did in the Victorian era. Flogging wasn't just a quick slap on the wrist, it was a full-on event with the person typically tied up and given a set number of lashes that could leave scars for life. This punishment wasn't exclusive to hardened criminals. Oh no, even some of the more vulnerable members of our communities could get a taste of the whip for acting up. And soldiers or sailors might find themselves on the receiving end for stepping out of line. The idea was that a good thrashing could correct any number of moral or disciplinary issues. Sounds pretty harsh, right? Well, that was Victorian justice for you. Very much about making the punishment fit the crime with a side of public humiliation to ensure you'd think twice before stepping out of line again. Next up on our list today, we have the debtor's prison. Imagine a world where you've just run out of luck with your finances and bam, you're sent off to a debtor's prison, which is about as fun as it sounds. So 
not fun at all. These places were grim. Think of the worst hotel you've ever seen, then remove any windows, heating, or good food. In debtor's prison, you were stuck until your debt was paid off, but here's where things get even more interesting. How in the world are you supposed to settle your debts when you're locked up and you can't work? It's kind of like trying to run a marathon with your legs tied together. Meanwhile, your family on the outside, yeah, forgot about them, they're just scrambling to get by without their main money earner, which often plunged them into their own financial crisis. Love that. It was just a vicious cycle that didn't do much for actually solving the problem of debt. Instead, it just added a hefty dose of misery and despair to the mix. It sounds like the Victorian era was actually just a lot of that. Misery and despair. So next time you're fretting about paying bills, just be thankful you're not doing it Victorian style, I guess. Or else I'd be in Roger's prison for my phone bill. Next up, we have the Scold's Bridal. Back in the Victorian era, if a woman was labeled a bit too chatty or opinionated, heaven forbid she actually nag, she might find herself in the not so stylish accessory known as the scold's bridle. Imagine a heavy, clunky metal mask clamping over your head, complete with a gag right in your mouth to put the kibosh on any further chit chat. Okay, not exactly the pinnacle of fashion or comfort, right? This contraption wasn't just about silencing. It was the 19th century version of public shaming with a generous dash of misogyny. Women were paraded around, their speech literally bridled as a warning to others that speaking out of turn wasn't just frowned upon, it was punishable. Thankfully, we've relegated such barbaric practices to the history books, but the scold's bridle remains a stark reminder of how far we've come in understanding and respecting individual rights and voices. Moving on down our list, we are talking about transportation next. Imagine you're living in 19th century Britain and things are frankly pretty bleak if you're not wearing a top hat and tails. Now imagine you've been caught stealing a loaf of bread or heaven forbid, a handkerchief. The punishment? Well, you're not just going to the local jail, you're being shipped off to the other side of the world. Transportation meant being packed off to Australia or Tasmania, places that were as remote and alien as the moon for many Brits at the time. These were no pleasure cruises. The journey alone could take months on cramped, disease-ridden ships where survival was a coin toss. Once you arrived, if you were still kicking, congratulations! Your prize was hard labor in brutal conditions, often in chain gangs or remote outposts where the sun seemed to have a personal vendetta against you. And forget about a leisurely pint at the pub, you were there to work, building the infrastructure for new colonies, often in sweltering heat or other extreme conditions. Speaking of hard labor, oh, the good old Victorian era where they took no pain, no gain to a whole new level, especially in prisons. So imagine you've been nabbed for stealing a loaf of bread, and yes, this is the only example I will be using like I'm Jean Valjean himself. So. Imagine you stole the bread and bam, you're sentenced to hard labor. And we're not talking about breaking a sweat at the gym, we're diving into the world of the treadmill and the crank machine. Victorian style gym equipment from your worst nightmare. Imagine being stuck on a never ending stairmaster the treadmill, not for your health, but as punishment, climbing to nowhere for hours. Then there's the crank machine, a mind numbing device that had prisoners turn a crank a mind blowing number of times just to complete their daily quota. And for what? Absolutely nothing. No purpose, no product, just pure fatigue and despair. It was the era's twisted way of teaching a lesson, breaking spirits under the guise of building character. So next time you moan about your gym routine, just remember it could have been a Victorian prison workout, all right? It's not so bad. You got this. Just a couple more flights of stairs. I don't know, I'm turning into um, David Goggins here. <laughs> I almost called him Jimmy Goggins for some reason. I don't know where that came from. Okay, anyways. Next up on our list, we have the pillory and stocks. Oh, the pillory and stocks. Imagine you're walking down the street in Victorian times and there's someone's head and hands locked up, sticking out of a wooden frame. Definitely quite the sight. This was the era's version of trending on social media, but instead of likes and shares, you get 
rotten tomatoes to the face. The poor folks caught in these contraptions were there for everyone to see, often in the town square, serving as a living warning against misbehaving. Passerbys weren't shy about expressing their opinions either. They'd hurl anything from spoiled veggies to less savory items, making sure the punished got their share of public scorn. It wasn't just about the physical discomfort, which was definitely no picnic, mind you. But the real kicker was the embarrassment. Imagine being the center of negative attention with every local and their dog coming out to see you as the day's unfortunate spectacle. Definitely not the kind of fame anyone would want. Also, there was like 10 people alive at this time. Everyone knows your business now. How embarrassing. Next up, let's dive into the eerie world of solitary confinement, Victorian style. Perhaps an even more miserable twist on a punishment that still exists today. You're locked up all by yourself in a tiny, gloomy cell with nobody to chat with but the spiders weaving their webs in the corner. Definitely not as nice as Charlotte. This was the reality for prisoners in the separate system, notably at places like the Eastern State Penitentiary in the US and Pentonville Prison in the UK. The idea was kind of like a forced meditation retreat, minus the zen and the tranquility. They thought making prisoners sit alone with their thoughts would lead to soul searching and moral reform. And this sounds very noble, of course, but in practice, it turned out to be more like a recipe for a mental breakdown. The isolation was so intense that many inmates ended up more losing their minds than reaching enlightenment. While it was all the rage back in the day, we now do know that too much alone time, especially in a dreary cell, can do more harm than good. Next up today, we are diving into the world of branding. It's the early Victorian era, a time when top hats were all the rage, and so, unfortunately, was branding people. Yes, you heard that right. Back in those days, if you were a soldier or a sailor who tried to ditch your duties or got caught doing something naughty, you might end up with a hot iron pressed against your skin. Ouch! Now, this wasn't your subtle hide it under your shirt kind of mark. We're talking about a blazing hot iron stamping a symbol on your face, your hand, or anywhere that it would be visible. The idea was to not just punish, but to label you as a wrongdoer for everyone to see. It was kind of like walking around with a I made a big oopsie sign etched on your skin. This brutal calling card did more than just sting and leave a scar. It messed up how people saw you and it slashed your chances of getting decent work. In a world without second chances, this was a harsh way to learn a lesson. So next time you think about skipping out on your duties, remember that in history that might have ended up with you quite literally being branded for life. And finally on our list today we have public whipping. I've definitely learned that during the Victorian era, they liked all the craziest things to be a public spectacle. So imagine you're walking through a Victorian era town square and suddenly there's a crowd gathering. Something's going down and it's not the local fair. It's a public whipping. So some poor soul, shirt ripped off, is tied to a post right in the center of the action. The whip cracks, and it's not just the sound that sends shivers down your spine, it's the whole thing. People are watching, some with horror, others with a kind of grim satisfaction, as each lash marks the offender's back. The idea? It's not just about the pain, which is definitely plenty, but it's also about the embarrassment of being the day's main entertainment. Getting whipped in front front of your neighbors, or worse, your family, is like adding a massive scoop of shame to your pain Sunday. Victorian society was big on moral lessons, and public whipping was like a live action cautionary tale, saying break the rules and this could be you, kind of puts a whole new spin on the idea of a public spectacle doesn't it? Number 10, Agent Orange. The vile war in Vietnam was brutal as the spread of violence echoed throughout each neighboring village. Agent Orange is a highly toxic chemical herbicide used by the United States as part of their onslaught against the Vietnamese. According to the US, they stated it was an herbicide to specifically clear vegetation in the dense forests and jungles of Vietnam, as well as the neighboring countries like Laos and Cambodia. Due to the fact that American forces were having difficulty finding Vietnamese troops in the forest, they chose to use this highly toxic chemical that not only destroyed their ecosystem, but had caused tremendous health issues in the civilians that were caught in 
in between the line of fire. Military personnel on both ends had experienced a long range of health issues, including various skin conditions, cancers, neurological disorders, as well as women in Vietnam experienced birth defects and miscarriages, as there was a significant number of birth defects in their offspring. 2.18 million gallons of Agent Orange was used in Vietnam, and even though there had been multiple dresses of the United States' reckless decision on using toxic gases, Dow Chemical Company, who sold the herbicide to the military, denied all liability and said no danger to human health. And like all injustices, the Circuit Court appeals dismissed the suit, and sure, some of the US veterans and their families got compensation, but still, many of them have mental health issues like PTSD. As well as for the Vietnamese, the ones whose land got destroyed by the US, to this day, their trees still won't grow back. Number 9. White Phosphorus Just like Agent Orange that can cause tremendous casualties, white phosphorus is prohibited as it is subjected to the international humanitarian law. It is prohibited to use white phosphorus as an incendiary weapon against civilian populations and in areas where there is a concentration of civilians. Here's why. I know it might be too graphic for our editors to put in, but as a viewer, I ask you to Google image white phosphorus burns and see why it should not be used. The issue with white phosphorus is that it makes it smoke through burning, and because they burn extremely hot, they are difficult to extinguish, which as a result, we see, if you look up the images, why the results look like the way it does. The burning particles adhere to skin and can continue to cause damage even after the initial contact, which is why we see multiple holes burn into the skin as white phosphorus can cause deep burns, all the way down to and even through the bone, and it can reignite even after initial treatment. So if you can imagine being dropped on this on you as a civilian and you have your family with kids, the result is tragic and inhumane. Its everlasting effects can be vile and devastating, and just like Agent Orange in Lebanon where they got attacked with white phosphorus from the Israeli forces, who right now is still bombing Gaza with white phosphorus, the burning of the Lebanese woods and forests include more than 40,000 ancient olive trees exacerbated the environmental impact of the conflict. Number 8. Targeting Hospitals when it comes to targeting civilians of nations when a war takes place, deliberating attacks on medical facilities and personnel depriving civilians of crucial healthcare is a war crime and an extreme punishment as a result of conflict and war. Hospitals and medical personnel are protected under international humanitarian law. Targeting hospitals and medical personnel intentionally and as tragedy of war is a war crime. Additional provisions of Article 19 under the Geneva Convention still allow hospitals to be protected even if it defends itself or has small arms and ammunition taken from the wounded. In 2008, Sri Lankan armed forces have launched attacks that struck hospitals, tens of thousands of civilians have been held hostages as shields by the armed forces, and many of the Sri Lankan armed forces unlawfully forced civilians' populations along with them in retreat. When medical staff at the Valayan Madame Hospital were doing their rounds, they found themselves in the middle of an aerial attack. One aid worker noted that as they were at the hospital, they noticed drones and everyone was getting down to cover. Then a barrage of bullets came. One of the doctors who was lying next to them was killed in a shrapnel piece that hit them in the head. Four or five people were killed and more than 30 were wounded in that attack. Despite these crimes that occurred in the hospitals or medical grounds, the Human Rights Watch calls all to the UN, but like as of right now, it seems like the UN does practically nothing. Number 7. Starvation and Denial of Humanitarian Aid The people of Hazel were cut off clean water, electricity, and access to any of the coming food by the occupying Israeli government in the early of October 2023. As of right now, there is no food in Hazel, and they're resorting to drinking salt water from the sea, as well as in order to charge their phone devices to reach out to family members are to show outreach to people what's happening in Gaza, they are charging their phones with car batteries on the roadside or trying to use solar panels that they have to get power. As of right now, over 10,000 Palestinians have died at the hands of the Israeli forces who many of casualties are children, but that doesn't include the ones who have died of starvation, dehydration, or malnutrition. Even in a documentary born in Gaza based on the onslaught that occurred in 2014, their boats were destroyed again by Israeli forces who were only allowed to fish less than 5 miles from the land. Starvation is a tactic used constantly in wars as a way to discipline or dismantle the spirits of the people they are occupying. Humanitarian aid workers unimplanted access to populations in dire needs of states that are using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare may constitute as a war crime. And according to the IIEA, the use of starvation of civilians' populations as a method of warfare is prohibited by international law. Number 6. Forced Labor Also known as slavery as we know consists of enslaving another person as property and ownership into bondage. And in history, my god, there were slaves everywhere. From ancient Greeks who were known for taking prisoners of war as slaves and mistreating them as an aggressive degree as there were no laws to protect them, as well as ancient Egypt and in ancient Rome. And as we know, with closer with our modern history, slavery conducted in Latin America was an economic and social institution that existed before the colonial era. After the conquest of Latin America by the Spanish and Portuguese, of the nearly 12 million slaves that were shipped across the Atlantic, over 4 million enslaved Africans were brought to Latin America. As of today, according to the Walk Free map, an estimated 50 million people were living in modern slavery on a given day in 2021, and an increase of 10 million since 2016. As well as their index, 2023 has placed the US among the small group of nations, which also includes China, North Korea, and Russia 
over it of compulsory prison labor. Number five, forced displacement. Andrew Jackson, a president of the United States, was known for many things, but most notably his onslaught of the native indigenous that brought forth the Trail of Tears. He signed the Indian Removal Act in 1830, which led to the forced removal of Native American tribes from their ancestral lands. Despite it being a negotiation in the act, these treaties weren't negotiations at all, but an ultimatum to the indigenous of these lands. The actual removal process was often brutal and devastating, leading to the deaths of thousands of Native Americans. In 1948, 700,000 Palestinians were displaced, fled, and were expelled from their homes as well. 70 massacres by the Israeli forces atrocities led to 15,000 Palestinians' deaths. As of right now, over 10,000 civilians, as I mentioned, being them children, are dead as they've been killed by the IDF. And as of right now, civilians of the northern Gaza are forced to leave their homes towards the south of the border town Yunus, which now the Gazans call the second Nakba. History repeats itself in different fonts with the same brutality but different faces, and no matter the era, it repeats. And yet we wait till the current time passes to ask ourselves, wow, they did that back then? When in reality, it's happening right now, like in Ukraine. Ukrainians who once lived in Ukraine are now displaced in refuge all over the world to avoid the war. And right now, like in Congo, an estimated 6.1 million people are currently internally displaced in DRC as of October 2022 and now. Which gives us another question. Why are these indigenous people on these lands refugees in their own country? Number four, firing squad. Execution by firing squad is another war crime as well as punishment in the time of war. A firing squad is normally composed of several soldiers, all of whom are usually instructed to fire simultaneously, thus preventing both distribution of the process of one member and identification of who fired the lethal shot. To avoid disfigurement due to multiple shots to the head, the shooters are typically instructed to aim at the heart, sometimes aided by a paper or a cloth target. Jose Rizal, a Filipino revolutionary who aided in the spark of the Filipino resilience against the Spanish colonization and occupation of the land, died by firing squad. But because Filipinos are gang AF, he told them, don't shoot me from behind. If you're gonna shoot me, look at me into the eyes when you do it. The commander of the firing squad refused and Jose did whatever he could to face death on his own terms. And when the sun rose with him dying, his last breath was consumptum es, which means it is finished. Firing squads were very common in the times of war as a way to kill prisoners of war, captive soldiers, traitors, and even civilians. Number three, mutilation. Forms of mutilation go through all kinds of brutal acts from slicing to cutting to firing a battery of attacks, even from the chemicals used in war mentioned earlier, is also a form of mutilation. But to get a little personal, on my dad's side, we had a guerrilla troop in World War II of just our family. And my grandfather told us that they had to fight the Japanese at night and sleep in the trees during the day in order to avoid being caught. But because of their tactics of killing the Japanese soldiers undetected, it pissed off a lot of the Japanese troops. So what would happen is that they would intimidate and raid barangays or villages saying, hey, where's the guerrilla troops and where are they hiding? Because the villagers didn't know who they were talking about, they were unfortunately met with cruelty and the Japanese soldiers would take the children, throw them up in the air and then stab them with batons on their guns or stuff children into barrels of water and then stab them with batons. The women would be viciously violated and the men's heads would be off and they would also do this in churches where they would cut off nuns and priests and their heads as well. This is war and it is violent and when you see the mutilation of war in real time on your phone on Instagram, you realize this is what some of our family members who have seen war might have seen and it's very heartbreaking. Number two, ethnic cleansing. In Yugoslavia lies the heartbreaking Bosnian genocide of which ethnic cleansing of Bosniak or Bosnian Muslims and the Crow populations were met with ultimate violence. Bosnian Serbs force engaged in a campaign of ethnic cleansing, forcibly removing Bosniaks and Croats from their homes, often subjecting them to extreme violence, forcing physical harm and killing. This resulted in a significant number of refugees and internally displaced persons, and the international community initially struggled to respond effectively to the conflict. However, as the scale of atrocities came increasingly apparent, diplomats' efforts were to make broker peace led to the Dayton Agreement in 1995. The Bosnian Genocide is a deeply tragic and painful chapter in recent history, and it serves as a stark reminder of the horrors that can occur when ethnic and nationalist tension escalate into violence. And finally, number one, genocide. We know that the Holocaust is one of the worst in history in regards to mass genocide, as it resulted over six million Jews' lives who had died under Germany's cruel, violent government and occupation. And when it comes to genocides around the world, there are so little efforts to stop it when it occurs. In fact, there are some going on right now, as little as it being done, like in Congo, Gaza, and Sudan. And some may not know in history History or might have forgotten other important, just devastating genocides in other parts of the world, like Rwanda in 1994. All in the span of 100 days of trauma, violence, statutory offenses, killings, and ethnic cleansings led to the genocide of 1,074,017 people of the Tutsi descent deaths. After the assassination of Juvenal, the Houthi president, the next day was when the genocidal killings began. Majority Houthi soldiers, police, and militia targeted key Tutsi and modern Houthi military political leaders. The scale and brutality of the genocide caused shock worldwide, but no country intervened to forcibly stop the killings. Most most of the victims were killed in their own villages or towns, and many of their neighbors and fellow villagers as well. The gang searched out victims hiding in churches and school buildings, and the militia killed victims with machetes and rifles, as well as massacred children who were hiding in a Polish church. War is barbaric, and world leaders should stop putting civilians at risk for their own self-interest. And just because we hear and know about the atrocities of war doesn't mean we should desensitize ourselves when we hear the numbers. These are real people. I mean, you're real. 
and so am I. And so are all the countless people I've mentioned whose lives are lost due to the result of selfish wars. And again, as a quote from Voltaire, history is the study of the world's crime. Number 10, displaced. Although the idea of exile doesn't seem like an unsettling outcome, but if you lived in ancient Greece, it is for sure something that you might want to be a little nervous about. Just like in Survivor or in any other modern game show, in Athens, every year they had a vote if they wanted to kick someone out. And if they voted yes, then in Ostracim, which is a little pot, they would actually be held two months later, and the citizens would give the name of those that they wished to ostracize to a scribe, as many of them were illiterate. And then they would scratch the name on the pottery shards, and the shards were piled up facing down so the votes would remain anonymous. The person whose pile contained the most ostraka, or basically the most votes, would be banished and would have to sashay away. The person newly ostracized would have 10 days to leave the city and if he attempted to return, the penalty was death. The property of the man banished was not confiscated and there was no loss of his status. On some plus side, after 10 years, he was actually allowed to return without stigma. Number 9, Slavery. In this time, they really were pro-slaves. If by any means of punishment you would mean of ending up as a slave, to the ancient Greeks, slaves are after all the expected to be loyal to their masters. A slave who ratted out on their masters would then be subsequently convicted and would be put to death for disloyalty. That's why they had to be tormented before a testimony could be taken. Enslaved people who lived and largely worked independently of their masters were those least likely to feel the iron rod of discipline. Athens slaves too could be physically punished or even tormented, and enslaved people elsewhere were also subjected to beatings. Athens alone was home to an estimated 60,000 to 80,000 slaves during the 5th and the 4th century BC, with each household having an average of three or four enslaved people attached to it. Slaves in ancient Greece did not have any human or civil rights, and they were tormented for different reasons. Their owner could beat them whenever he wanted, because he was a jerk, or their testimony was needed for a lawsuit. They were tormented into confessing to their own guilt or incriminate someone else. Number eight, flogging. Yeah, you might be familiar with this one. Flogging, or known as whipping, was also used in ancient Greece. Offenders could be subjected to beatings or implements like a whip or a rod, which were meant to cause pain and severe as a deterrent. For these times, ritual floggings were actually practiced and heretics were whipped with a thong of oxtail leather or parchment strips. When the cane strikes or objects like these are used, the blood is forced from the tissue beneath. Damages of the small blood vessels and individual cells would cause leakage of blood and tissue fluid into the skin and underlying tissue, increasing the tension in these areas. In ancient Athens, bodily punishments like flogging and whipping are deemed inappropriate for free Athian men, but were actually more reserved for slaves and foreigners. Number seven, barbecue two. Yes, I know the whole uh, stick thing, but that's what they did. Like all other forms of punishment, the pike or impalement was the next course of the deal. The victim was inserted halfway up their back privates while held above the spike for longitudinal, and the spike would run them through as the gravity took hold, avoiding vital organs emerging through the skin on the shoulder or neck. For several days, a person might endure this. Instead, the torso was penetrated by the stake during transversal, either from the front to the back or other way around. Impalement was a very common practice across the Pharaonic Egypt, Europe, Mesopotamia, and the ancient Near East, the Neo Assyrian Empire, and of course, ancient Greece. Number six, I believe I can fly. In ancient Greece, another method of execution was the act of throwing a criminal over a precipice. This practice was not limited to Athens, but it was actually very prevalent in other regions like Sparta, Delphi, Corneth, etc. The execution would involve pushing the convict over a high, steep cliff where they would fall into a deep trench known as Verathion in Athens. This particular form of execution was typically reserved for individuals who were convicted of religious or political crimes. The denial of burial rights further added the humiliation and disgrace brought upon the criminal, as they would be left unburied, their remains exposed and vulnerable to the elements, as well as the animals. Reference to this method of execution are not found after 400 BC, and the Athians appear to have dug a new trench in the 4th century, but this was probably designed to receive convicts who were executed by other means. Number 5, rats. They really do love using rats back in the day, but to be honest, you'd be surprised that they use rats even as recent as 1970s in Chile and Argentina during the Dirty War using the same methods. The method, if some might know, involved trapping rats in a bottomless cage atop a victim's abdomen. Burning coals were then placed on a small tray atop the cage, heating the metal from above. Desperation to escape the heat, the rats would begin to burrow only through the soft surface that they could find, which is the victim's flesh. With sharp claws and teeth, the rats would quickly gnaw their way into the victim's bowels, causing excruciation, pain, and terror. The technique particularly came in handy when, I, as I mentioned before, the Dutch leaders were trying to extract information from Spanish enemies. As soon as the cage rats replaced 
place on the prisoner's stomach, the terrified men would often give up and they would actually just expose everything else that they knew. Number four, stoning. Stoning or lapidation is a form of capital punishment where a group throws stones at a person until the subject dies from a blood trauma. It has been attested as a form of punishment from grave misdeeds since ancient times. Stoning is attested in the Near East since ancient times as a form of capital punishment for grave sins. However, stoning as a practice was not geographically limited to only near the East as it is also a significant historical record of stoning being employed in the West as well. Ancient geographers describe both the elder and younger astrocities being stoned to death in ancient Greece around the 7th century BCE. Stoning is condemned by human rights groups as a form of cruel and unusual punishment and torment as a serious violation of human rights. As of now, human rights organizations argue that many acts targeting of stoning should not be legal in the first place by allowing them interferes with people's rights to private life. Number three, brazen bull. Throughout history, humans in general have created an enclave of many extraordinary things. One of the cruelest punishments invented in ancient Greece, this particular type of torment, was just as pleasant as everything else on this list, or rather unpleasant. The brazen bull was just that of a sculpture of a bull with a fire built underneath it. The victim was placed inside and slowly roasted to death as the fire burned and the metal grew hotter and hotter. I'm pretty sure you can imagine the pain of the victims that they were in so that the creators of the brazen bull would just enjoy it. The bull was casted hollow and was used with a fire built below and it was designed so that it could be opened and a person would be forced inside. As I mentioned, the fire would start underneath and the person would be burnt as the smoke and steam would escape through the nose. Incense was also placed inside to counteract the smell of burning flesh and it is said that the series of tubes inside the statue was designed to distort the screams of the victims to make it sound like an animal. Once the individual had succumbed into their charred state, apparently the people there would also use their bones and turn them into bracelets. Number two, the rack. The rack was a torment device consisting of a rectangular frame with a roller at each end. The victim's limbs were stretched and tied to the rollers by turning the rollers, the body would be subjected to increasing tension, causing extreme pain and potential dislocation or dismemberment of their joints. The exact origin of the rack uh, is pretty unclear, but the earliest mention of its use was in ancient Greece. The rack was often used as a torment method to extract confession, with the execution itself coming anyway from another method. Nevertheless, victims would perish on the rack, and for those who did not, it was far more likely more painful for the persecutor to the method of actual execution. The most infamous case of the rack as it used in ancient Greece was associated with Herostratus, an arsonist who was on fire to the second temple of Artemis in Ephesus in 356 BC. Finally, number one, crucifixion. This form of execution was mostly associated with the death of Jesus, was rather practiced in ancient Greece, but there is at least one mention in the historical text of the Greeks condemning someone to this slow and excruciating death. According to the Greek writer Herodotus in his histories, there's an account of the execution of a Persian general by the Athenians around 479 BC. The Persians had burned Athens just a year prior in 480 BC, so the harsh punishment may have reflected the intense anger of the Greeks. In any case, Herodotus wrote that they nailed him to a plank and hung him and this, as you know, is a form of crucifixion. Number 10, stuck in the middle. The pillory consisted of hinged wood boards forming holes through which the head and or various limbs were inserted and the boards were locked together to secure the captive. Pillories were set up to hold people in marketplaces, crossroads, and other public places. They're often held on platforms to increase public visibility of the person and often a plate card detailing the crime that was placed nearby. These these punishments generally lasted only for a few hours, but by then you would want to contact your therapist by using BetterHelp, or if you're lucky in a country with free healthcare, contact your doctor for a psych eval. In being forced to bend over forward and stick your head through and your hands out in front of them, offenders in the pillory would have been extremely uncomfortable during their punishment. However, the main purpose in putting criminals in the pillory was to humiliate them in public. On discovery that the pillory was occupied, people would get excited as they would gather in the marketplace to taunt, tease, and laugh at the offender on display. Those who gathered to watch the punishment typically wanted to make the offenders experience a little bit more unpleasant as possible because why wouldn't they? As it was in their form of entertainment, if you were poor and didn't have a job, you might as well take some of the time of your day off and throw tomatoes at someone that can't fight back. Number nine, just to trim. Shaving one's head has actually been used as a form of punishment for centuries. From ancient times to modern day, it has been used to shame, humiliate, and punish individuals for various reasons. However, the effects of this punishment can be severe and long lasting. And in these times, they would also shave one's head before carrying them out to other punishments. For example, heretics, citizens who criticize their leaders, or in most cases, the king or emperor, etc., or even women who committed adultery, they would be forcibly gotten their head shaved, almost as a public display of showing of shame for their treason. The psychological impact of shaving one's head as a punishment can be traumatic, as it could lead to low self-esteem, depression, and anxiety. In some cases, it can even lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, aka PTSD. For some people, it might not seem like that scary as a punishment, but it is still a form of humiliation even used today. It's used as a punishment for minor offenses in some cultures, as well as punishment in schools and in prisons. Because of this, it leads to a culture of fear and oppression. Shaving heads without one's consent is a punishment and a violation of human rights and dignity as it violates the rights of privacy and personal autonomy. Number eight, flogging.
flogging. When it comes to another form of public punishment, some might be subjected into flogging or being whipped in public. Typically, flogging has been imposed as an unwilling subject as a punishment. However, it can also be submitted to willingly, uh, yeah, and even done by oneself in a sadomasochistic or religious context. Offenders could be subjected to beatings with implements like a whip or a rod, which were meant to be causing pain and severe as a deterrent. In the Dark Ages, the Whipping Act was passed in England in 1530. Under this legislation, vagrants were taken to a nearby populated area and they would be tied by the end of a cart naked and beaten with whips throughout the town till the body should be very bloody. Although most of the whippings are typically done where the victim is wrapped around a pillar with their back exposed, there's also another thing called foot whipping where one's feet are exposed. In some countries, this punishment of foot whipping is still executed in public to this day. Number seven, marked. In forms of corporal punishment from temporary to more permanent involving the following on the list. Although in some cultures, tattooing isn't seen as a bad thing, but to other heritage is a source of pride, but in some cases, they're also used in means of marking an individual for their shame. Matthew Hawthorne, the Scarlet Letter famously marked its protagonist, Hester Prine, with a red letter A for adultery after accusations about her behavior. Hawthorne's book is more about fiction, as adulterers were really forced to mark their clothing to identify their crime. Like Hester Prine, A or the letters AD, as outlined by Plymouth Colony Law from 1658, adulterers were seen publicly without their letters were subjected to public whipping and even more humiliation and social alienation. The humiliation can be extended intentionally or not by leaving visible marks such as scars. This can be a main intention of the punishment as in this case of scarifications such as human branding. Number six, tis but a scratch. The medieval era's definition of period between the civilization of antiquity and the rational humanization of renaissance is strongly associated with uncontrolled emotional violence both within and outside the judicial systems in the place at the time. Mutilation by contrast involves the removal or irreparable disfigurement by any means of making small portions of one of those larger sections of a living or dead person. The latter would include castration, removing of one's private parts, evisceration, removing of internal organs, and flaying, which is a removal of someone's skin. With a split nose or the brand of the city on your forehead, not only had you endured a painful experience, but everyone could see for the rest of your life that you had committed a crime. The reason this barbaric penalty was sought out was to avert heavier punishments like the death penalty, but even methods that do result in a death penalty do not avail light to those receiving the punishment. Number five, rotisserie. My bad, I had to think of a title for this one, but I know it's pretty grim. Impalement was used as a form of torment and execution in which a person is pierced with a long stake. This method would lead to a slow, painful death, and often the victim was hoisted into the air after partially impaled. Gravity and the victim's own struggles would cause him to slide down the pole, and death could take many days. Impalement was precise in the European times throughout the Middle Ages. Vlad III, the Dracula, as we know, who learned this method by killing by impalement while staying in Constable, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, as a prisoner and Ivan the Terrible have passed into legend as major users of this method. His method of torment was a horse attached to each of the victim's leg as a sharpened stake was gradually forced into the body. Death by impalement was slow and agonizing as victims sometimes endured for hours or even days. Vlad often had stakes arranged in various geometric patterns as well. So in some way, he had a dream and a vision like an Ikea catalog magazine. So like, here's my barbecue, my outdoor swimming pool, and my impaled prisoners in the shape of a star. Number four, OG Lipo. Pretty straightforward type of torment, although just as disgusting or disgutting. <laughs> Intestinal crank was a method of torment, or rather a capital punishment, involving making an incision in the abdominal area, separating the duodenum from the pylorus, and attaching of the upper part of the intestine to a crank. The crank would then be rotated to extract the intestines from the gastrointestinal cavities of the conscious person. The outcome was always death, but not immediate, so they would be watching their guts coming out. Number three, don't sleep. The heretic's fork was a torment device consisting of a long length metal with two opposing bipronged forks as well as an attached belt or strap. The device was placed between the breastbone and the throat just under the chin and secured with a leather strap around the neck. Although the victim was hung from the ceiling or otherwise suspended in a way so that they couldn't lie down, a person wearing it couldn't fall asleep. The moment that their head would drop with a little bit of fatigue, the prongs would pierce their throat or their chest, causing extreme great pain. This very simple instrument created long periods of sleep deprivation and people were awake for days which made confessions a bit more easier for those giving the punishment. Number two, Lefestin. Unsure where this was originally originated, but it was actually used at least far back as 60 CE in the Roman Empire. Emperor Nero also used this method of torment as a tools of justice against his enemies, and if we know Nero, he was all sure a fan of torment. Those awaiting punishment were placed in loose pants that were tied tightly around the ankles, and rats were then poured into the pants where they were scratched and bit the prisoners' legs and groins while they were trying to escape the fabric. One of the most fiendish forms of rat torture emerged when the Dutch revolt in 16 
16th and 17th century. The method involved trapping rats in a bottomless cage atop a victim's abdomen or their chest. Burning coals were then placed on top of this tray atop the cage, heating the metal from above, desperate to escape the heat. The rats would then begin to burrow the only way out, which is the person's stomach or their chest. With sharp claws and teeth, the rats will quickly gnaw their way into the victim's bowels, causing excruciating pain and terror. The technique was particularly came in handy when Dutch leaders were trying to extract information from their Spanish enemies. As soon as the caged rats were placed on a prisoner's abdomen, the terrified men would just give up and tell them everything before the coals were added on top. And finally, number one, cooked. Although it's noted that the most famous form of torment and method of getting rid of a witch was to burn her or put them in the stake, but this was more common in Europe during the early 1300s and then at the end of the 17th century. In the Middle Ages, burning was used as both a form of torment as well as a capital punishment. As a form of torment, the victim's feet would be held to a fire or trapped into metal boots that were heated up. Or they could be strapped into an iron chair that was lit on fire underneath or red hot irons that could be applied. Metal torments instruments were also often heated, pincers, pliers, and so on. Burning or molted liquids could also be used. The victim would also be forced to dip limbs in them or even have them poured down their throats as a form of capital punishment. Burning has always had a long history for crimes as treason for heresy, blasphemy, and witchcraft being regarded by the Christian churches as treason against God. It's the elephant. Those same guys that you watch paint at the zoo or roll around in the mud are the same hardcore MFs that used to be weapons of war in South and Southeast Asia. While elephants were no strangers to the battlefields, they were a common capital punishment method as well, called the Gungareo, as they were smart and easily trainable. They could be used to crush, dismember, or overall torment captives in very public death sentences. The earliest record of death via elephant dates back to the classical period. However, the practice was already well established by that time and continued well into the 19th century. The most common way that the execution by elephant was carried out was the obvious, crush its victim to death with brute force. But elephants were even sometimes used in a kind of trial by ordeal where the condemned prisoner is released if he manages to fend off the elephant for long enough. The Mughal Emperor Akbar the Great is said to have used this technique to chastise rebels and then in the end the prisoners, presumably much chastened, were given their lives. So this obviously tells you that aside from enemy soldiers, civilians who commit certain crimes could also be punished in this brutal way. These crimes included theft, tax evasion heresy, and rebellion. During the expedition to central India in 1868, Louis Rosalette a French writer, photographer, and traveler described a death sentence of a criminal by elephant. The sketch was made of the event showing the condemned being being forced and placing his head on a pedestal and then being held there while the elephant foot crushed his head. Yeah. So punishment number nine is branding, a global classic. Who in the ancient world wasn't branded B words for doing stuff they didn't want them to do? Now in Euro nations, it was usually women or servant workers getting marked up, but in India, it was also a punishment for things other than being caught with your pants down, literally. See, how they liked to do it was the culprit was branded with a hot iron, smack dab in the center of their forehead with the words describing the offense. If you stole eggs, they will brand stole eggs on your face, which is equally hilarious and embarrassing. So I guess the shame part would really actually work there, especially because this branding punishment always came with a reduction of social class too. This method was commonly used in classical societies. In India, it was practiced during the Mughal rule and it since has been completely abolished. Punishment number eight is pillory. This device was shared between a few nations. The Europeans love this crap and used it on women constantly. As you may know from the Bumblebee videos, top 10 spine chilling ways women were punished in medieval times, part one and two. If you have haven't seen those, maybe go check them out on our channel and subscribe to The Hive while you're at it so you don't miss out on anything else. In pillory, the offender was compelled to stand in a public place with his head and hands locked in the iron frame so that he couldn't move. Uncomfortably hunched over, the victim would ha then have his ears nailed to the pillory through the top cartilage so his head is forced up on an angle adding to the uncomfortable position of the spine. It would essentially be like this. Then finally, the victim would be whipped, branded, or stoned. However, if the victim was super hella dangerous, I don't know, maybe he was like a top soldier turned evil, but had really good battle skills, and they had to be concerned about that. They'd use the pillory just to restrain him while they physically nailed the guy's actual body to a wall 
then stoned them. This was practiced till the 19th century. Punishment number seven is lost limbs. In other words, it means damaging a person severely, especially by removing a part of the body. It's another classic amongst the medieval societies, and like others who like to cut limbs off as punishment, it was usually the nose, ears, hand, or feet in India. Whatever the crime was determined the limb lost. During that period, one or both of the hands of a person were chopped off if the offender committed theft. If he indulged in intercourse offenses, such as violating someone, his privates were cut off. That one still happens nowadays, just usually once the prisoner is already in jail. Not done by the government. Anyways, back to it. If he told a lie or criticized God, his tongue would be cut off, and if he was deceitful or untrustworthy, his ears were cut off. Punishment number six is brain ablaze. So, in ancient India, it turns out another fun punishment was to have certain parts, but only parts, of your body set on fire. This punishment came in alongside the upheavals of ancient Indian political history, wherein kings and dynasties faced endless threats and challenges from rivals. Enough so that, like all kingdoms, violence against the king became a serious political problem that had to be dealt with ruthlessly and effectively through preemptive action, punishment, and retaliation. The punishment for one who reviles, spreads evil news about the king, or reveals council secrets is punished with tearing out the tongue, as forementioned. More severe crimes against the king and kingdom, however, invite more severe punishment. Death by setting fire to the hands and head is a punishment for one who covets the kingdom, forces entry into the king's harem, attacks the king's palace, aids his enemies, incites forced people or enemies, or causes a rebellion in a fortified city, countryside, or army. The man is restrained, his head and hands doused in sulfur or another flammable, and little blaze. Punishment number five is blown asunder. This was the advent of British colonialists who tormented India in the 18th and 19th centuries. Blowing from a G word I can't say on YouTube involved the condemned being tied in front of a cannon so that the small of their back was forced against the muzzle. Their arms and legs would be tied behind them, the rope pulled taunt enough that it curves their limbs back behind them uncomfortably. The cannon would then be fired, pretty much obliterating the prisoner's abdominal portion and blowing them half. Bonus points for all the guts raining down on everyone. One contemporary observer reported that a head was blown almost 50 feet in the air once, and limbs sometimes landed 100 yards away, and the rest of the body essentially just vaporized. Punishment number four is torn apart. Another colonial classic. This style of death sentence is found everywhere from Rome to medieval Britain to Persia. For those unfamiliar with this punishment, you'd have your four limbs tied either between two horses, one holding both arm ropes and holding both both leg ropes, or it'd be one horse for each of your limbs. At the count of three, all horseback riders would take off in opposite directions and rip the person in the center apart. In ancient India, however, instead of using horses, they used oxen. For example, a law was in place that women caught killing their husbands or family members, killing others by poison, or committing arson are to be torn apart by oxen. Punishment number three is cooked alive. The sensation of being boiled alive was an absolutely horrific one, yet it was a punishment for things as meager as theft or lying. A large cauldron was filled with water, oil, tar, fat, or molten lead, and left to boil. Putting a victim in the cauldron before the boiling was done was the worst way to exert this punishment, as it meant they would probably remain conscious, and then he'd notice his eyes burning, clothes fusing with his body, and skin blistering. The limbs and extremities were the first things to burn after that. After the person's outer layers began to cook, their organs began to cook as well, and their bodily fluids rose in temperature so they were also boiling inside. All who went through this medieval death could could only pray for a fast and merciful one. But boiling to death was unfortunately a very slow process. A quick death would only come, as said, if the liquid was already boiling when the victim is dunked in. If it wasn't and they wanted to speed up their own deaths, the victim could always duck their head underneath the liquid and just boil their own brain that way. But otherwise, it was long and horrific until the very end. While this should have been reserved for only the worst offenders, it soon became a go-to death sentence for foragers of all people. In India, it was said in the Garuda Puranam, that the people who didn't offer food to orphans and contaminated food are boiled in oil after their death. In 1606, Guru Arjan of the Sikhs was boiled alive as a form of torment and subsequently died on the orders of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Punishment number two is exposure. While 
this was less common in ancient India, it was part of other punishments such as pillory, whipping posts, or stocks, or it was used as a method of gaining confession. Victims could be exposed to the elements by restraining them somewhere outside, whether on the ground, which was more susceptible to bugs, pests, animals, and grime, or somewhere suspended, like a cage, off a wall. That one was popular in Europe. In summer, the guards could just pour hot water over the victim's head repetitively, which eventually increased body temperatures to the extent that heat stroke would take effect, causing a victim to die slowly and painfully. Sometimes the body was even left to decay publicly to dissuade any further crimes. During cold days and nights, the chill, as well as the lack of protection from the wind, could easily sap a victim's body heat. Alternatively, the victim could be buried up to his neck, letting any animals, insects, or other people kill him slowly the way they want to. Due to its cost efficiency and cruelty, the exposure torment strategy was widespread in medieval Europe and many other places. In many cases, the victim was sentenced to a short period of exposure depending on the crime. However, death was frequent since they were completely defenseless, even if it wasn't intended to be more than a two day punishment. You never know. Punishment number one is immurement. However, it is more identifiable to the common person if I just call it being buried alive. Placing someone into a confined space and then sealing it up so they're forced to wait for their own death, whether it comes from dehydration, starvation, or even asphyxiation. Immurement also had been performed for aesthetic reasons in Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism, and examples can be found in plenty of written sources. The year is 1660 and the place is India. On the 6th of May, Shah Shoja, the second son of the Mughal Emperor, boarded a ship and sailed from Dhaka to Arakan to find asylum from his brother who was now his father's successor and wanted to kill him. Shah's plan was to stay in Arakan for a short period before sailing over to Mecca, then Persia. But he landed there just as the monsoon season hit and it trapped the prince in Arakan for many months. And then, for life. See, while stuck there, the king asked Shah if his eldest daughter would marry his son. For some reason, this really grilled Shah's onions and he tried to overthrow the Attican king in a coup, which then was found out. Although Shah managed to escape into the jungle, he was subsequently caught and put to death. The prince's family, however, were thrown into prison after their capture, although they were set free later. Moreover, the king married Shah's eldest daughter himself. He didn't even give it to her son, really just spit on dad's grave like that. It seems like the surviving family members of Shah, including that eldest daughter, plotted to seize power again and overthrow the king, having clearly learned nothing. Like the last time the conspiracy was leaked, and this time the king meant business. If his family was going to keep being a problem, he was just going to exterminate the entire thing. According to the 17th century French physician and traveler Francois Bernard, the men were decapitated with axes, whilst the women were closed confined in their apartments and left to die of hunger. All the windows and doors had been sealed. Even Shah's eldest daughter, now the king's wife, was not spared. Imagine living somewhere where you could literally be asked, hey, uh, could you die over there please? Called prohibition of death laws. They've shown up through history and around the world, and some argue that not much action is taken to enforce or punish violators, but that's because it'd be kind of hard, right? Well, this is the island of Delos, considered a holy site by the ancient Greeks. You can see the many of the old temples and statues that were erected in worship of the gods there. Check her out, she's a beaut, Clark. Classic architecture, clear teal waters, and dream vacay. No better place than to die. Until the 6th century BC, when a whack job tyrant named Pisistrius ordered all of his soldiers, serfs, workers, whatever, to remove every dead body from the island as they had rendered it impure. Shovels in hands, they really did remove the dead bodies one by one until they felt they were all gone. I doubt you can actually remove all the dead bodies from any piece of land, but I imagine they probably got pretty damn close. And from there it became law in the Greek kingdom that it was illegal to die on the island of Delos. I guess if you drop dead, they just like leave a fine on your body, tuck it in your belt loop maybe, all saucy like, who knows. This wasn't the only place this happened though. Check out the coastal town of Le Lavador, France. Sheesh, what is up with not being able to die in luxury. This is nice. Anyways, due to the disputes over the crowded cemeteries, ordinances to build new cemeteries, and conflicts with local environments and environmentalists, the mayor just tossed his hands up and said, you know what? If nobody can share, nobody gets any. And passed a law forbidding residents from dying.
crying. See guys, this is why we use our words and our listening ears. For everyone who makes fun of people's height, just know the courts will favor a short king. You should never make fun of someone for something they can't control, and height is a big one. Men especially face a lot of scrutiny and rejection for it, and we're at a point where nowadays, if you're literally 5'8", people will say you're short. Gentlemen, that is not the case. So, if you've ever been called short, listen to this. According to the 18 Laws of Kin, a set of legal codes written on bamboo slips that were unearthed in the Hubei province in 1975, during the Qin Dynasty of China, there was a law stipulating that men and women shorter than the height 1.52 meters do not have to bear any criminal responsibility for any crimes they committed. Apparently, this was because the household registration system, known as Hukoi today, was incomplete at the time, so it was often impossible to verify a person's age. So, the government used height. The founder of the Qin Dynasty himself, Qin Shi Huang, apparently only reached 1.5 meters tall, that's 5 feet, when he was 22. So he allegedly believed that his subjects could only be defined as adults once they grew taller than that. So yeah, short kings prevail. Nothing is more freaky than government mandated furry costumes. Europe really tried just about anything in the way of public shaming to air out someone's criminal history. Unlike China or Japan, which literally tattooed faces, the Ottomans who cut off hands, or even their European ancestors who chopped off noses and ears, the 17th and 18th century Europeans took a new tactic, shame masks. The uncomfortable apparel was made out of solid metal and would have been painful and super heavy when strapped tightly to your face. Naturally, it's abrasive, it's rusty, it's riddled with tetanus. But don't worry, there are lots of cool styles, like these jaunty pagan god looking dudes. As mentioned, there are these weird animal heads like medieval furry getup. This one's a rooster, and apparently to quote, those who were, well, the other name for a rooster, swaggering and vainglorious, would be forced to wear a rooster mask for hours, even a day. Which may not sound that bad, but again, chafy, hot, heavy cast iron, the pressure of which is on your scalp and your collarbones. And apart from these terrifying masks, criminals were given humiliating badges they had to wear for, yeah, rest of their life. Next up, we got the M&M's Trial by Ordeals. And by M&M, I mean Medieval and Mesopotamia, not the M&M candy franchise out here trialing people by fire. And while I may be joking around, these trials were no joke. If you stole a bunch of crap and you were caught, they just hang you, no questions asked. But when ordeals are deemed appropriate for the crime committed, well, they weren't effing around. You you were about to go through the holy test ringer, and your punishment it failed was excommunication from the church, because God clearly didn't believe in your good name. Kind of like a Mean Girls Regina George burn book. But that was just the beginning. There were three types of ordeals for medieval Europe. Being tossed in cold water, and if you think you're innocent, float you're guilty, makes sense. Hot water ordeal requires you to pick a stone from boiling water and heal from those burns in three days if you want to be innocent. And finally, hot iron, because being able to carry a pound of boiling iron meant you were righteous. Did literally anyone past that. Meanwhile, trial and ordeal in Mesopotamia allowed the gods to decide criminal accusations, in which case I hope they all learned how to float or swim young because God came in the form of a rapid river. The law goes as follows, if anyone bring an accusation against a man, the accused go to the river and leaps in the river. If he sinks in the river, his accused shall take possession of his house. But if the river proves that the accused is not guilty and he escapes unhurt, then he who has brought the accusation shall be put to death and the guy who jumped in the river gets to take the house of the accused. Accuser. Whatever. So what I'm hearing is, welcome everyone to Mesopotamia's favorite game show, Drown or Win a House, where contestants go before the court, their gods, and one rapid river to face off the ultimate test. Are they innocent or guilty? And now for a punishment I don't even want to know how they discovered, tickly lickly torture. Some names are misleading and others are quite on the nose. This is a beautiful middle ground of both. So the victims are laid out in front of a goat, their feet are covered in salt water, goats love them salt and they love sodium, so they lick and lick and lick at the sole of his foot. And fun fact for you guys who aren't out here feeling goat tongues up often or haven't eaten manish water, they're pretty much like giant cat tongues. So rough that once the skin is pruny from a couple batches of the salt water and goat spit, the abrasive tongue will literally rip layers of skin off the foot. There's been cases of this method going so far that goat licked to expose the bones. The punishment was only ever rumored to be used in medieval France and it's only ever described in a 1502 Italian document. Imagine a time and a place where asking some folks, hey, you want to get dinner and drinks would get you executed. The Han 
some food restrictions. The Han Dynasty had some fickle little food laws and regulations, it appears, and for some reason they had wild punishments for them. For example, the law stipulates that dinner without a valid reason will be fined if caught, and if there's beef on the table, it will be cut directly. Does that do something to the beef? I don't get that part. I also don't get the part where between 206 BC and 220 CE, having a few drinks with the boys could get you literally decapitated. The law stated that if three or more people got together to drink, the participants would be fined four towels of gold. If you're unable to pay, obviously you face severe consequences because why can you afford to drink but not pay a fee? The only exception to this rule were gatherings such as weddings, funerals, and festivals. Many rulers and dynasties attempted to regulate the consumption of alcohol in some part because making alcohol required grains like rice, and that supply was often short. Rulers also feared that drunken civilians could easily turn disorderly and violent and cause some peace issues. Can't talk unusual and freaky without bringing up the Mongols and their Yasa law. The Yasa decrees are only available to us through secondary sources as there's no comprehensive Mongol scroll or codex found so far. Naturally, this can be problematic and our knowledge of Yasa law is nothing like the older code of Hammurabi. This is due to the fact they, well, they weren't literate. So yeah, the laws were told verbally. What we know of Yasa, declared by Genghis himself, is it concerned itself with people, not property, and aimed for three things. Obedience to Genghis Khan, a binding together of nomenclads, and merciless punishment of wrongdoing. Nowadays we've managed to collect some of their laws together and I'm going to read you some of this list. So we have urinating in water or ashes is punishable by death. One may not dip their hands into water and must instead use a vessel for drawing water. Probably a hygiene thing, but at least it's not death, you know? It's forbidden to wash clothing until completely worn out. And don't forget when you do go to wash them, it's forbidden to bathe or wash garments in running water during thunder. I can't make sense of that one. And then also there's the one where parents can arrange a marriage between their children even if one or both are already dead. But the weirdest thing aren't even the articles, it's the penalties. Only death is ever specified as a consequence. Adultery, death. Take someone against their will, death. Peeing in water, death. Don't answer con calls, death. Giving out food or clothing captives, death. Death, 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 death. Now it also includes some pretty chill laws like Genghis ordered that all religions to be respected and no preference be shown to any of them. So I mean, you win some, you lose some. Up next is like country boys at Boots and Hearts. You gotta chug, chug, chug. This law and punishment comes to us from the Sui Dynasty of China, which the duration was 581 to 618 BC. If you've seen some of my videos about ancient China, you may know that getting into the royal court for work could be pretty blessed for you, your biddy, and any kids or family you have. Some parents went as far as to snip their kids' junk so they could potentially be a eunuch for their emperor in the future. If you don't wanna do that, you could always take the imperial exam, the Keiju, which theoretically allows anyone in the country to become a government official. But failing the test was not without consequence, especially if you weren't neat. According to the Book of Soi, uh, the official historical records of the Soi dynasty, the law stipulated that examinees with bad handwriting would be punished by being forced to drink one shang of ink, aka a literal leader. Don't think you can drop out either once you learn that and you know you can't improve your handwriting in time. The penalty for dropping out is also to chug down some ink. Why so extreme over some exams? Well, exam and answers were in theory written by the emperor, even though in practice his officials would be the ones doing the grading. So even if the emperor didn't see it, bad handwriting indicated disrespect to him, the son of heaven. Also if you failed the examination, guess what your punishment is? Drink some more ink. Had to throw something violently nauseating in at the, on this list at some point, so we got death by Dumbo. This is gonna be rough, you guys, and it makes it obvious colonies of Asia were not effing around. Hope you're ready. So, elephants were used to crush and even gore criminals to death in medieval South and Southeast Asia. This method was popular in India from the Mughal period into the late 19th century. The criminals were laid down either face down, a blessing, I imagine, or face up to see their incoming demise, which was wild and angry elephants, who ran over them repeatedly, ensuring a quick yet very painful death. The most common form, however, was mano a mano, when a convict was laid down and an elephant walked over to the execution site by the handlers and deliberately made to stamp on the torso or head. Elephants are clever creatures, and reportedly they could be taught to slice and gore criminals to death with pointed blades fitted to their tusks. Imagine an elephant in a blind rage running at you with butcher knives duct taped to its tusks because that's literally what their last moments would have 
be like. All right, let's talk mud now. Not any old mud, it's mud, the glorious mud. Gonna say mud way too much, it's gonna feel made up. So execution by suffocation was a common practice of the ancients. Look at hanging or wax stuff, like water torment. However, in the medieval period, a very strange kind of suffocation technique was used called mud, the glorious mud. And yes, you have to say it like that, so follow me on screen. Mud, the glorious mud. Yay, okay, I'll stop. So some historians tell us that criminals would be killed by throwing him or her into a pit of stinky mud, usually also packed with human filth and feces, because this is medieval Europe. The convict would either die by drowning or by suffocation. However, this was also a common accidental death for the exhausted armor-laden soldiers laying injured on battlefields. Anyways, being drowned or suffocated in mud for punishment does seem to have been rare, thankfully, primarily known to happen in the Burgundy region of France, where it was a punishment reserved specifically for women who left their husbands. So we'll start with punishment one, tattooing. You may have seen our video, the top 10 messed up punishments from the Tokugawa era, in which case tattoos as punishment may sound familiar. While Japan and China were on different wavelengths and doing their own things, this is something they had in common for criminals. Although tattooing has been known in China for centuries, it has been in the most part an uncommon practice outside of their indigenous peoples. Throughout Chinese history, tattooing has been seen as a defamation of the body, something undesirable, and this originates likely with the penal tattooing as one of the five capital punishments in ancient China. The first, and considered the lightest of the five punishments, had criminals' upper cheeks or forehead or other visible parts of the body tatted up. It was usually words that described their misdemeanors or the location of their exile or name of their hard labor camp. These tattoos are obviously permanent and very visibly marked out their bearers as ex-criminals for life. Even should the criminal ever return from exile, the tattoo would mark them as what they were. The Kinlaw Code covered so many offenses that common people frequently did not realize they had committed a crime until they'd been arrested. So you really could be just minding your business one day and boom, face tat the next. Next is amputations. So after tattoos, the next was rhinotomy, aka the snip snip of a criminal's nose. Like tattooing, it left the victim scarred for life. But because sharp items and blood were involved, rhinotomy and the next two penalties following after often resulted in death, even if not their intention, just due to things like bleeding out or infections. Then level three is amputation of feet, aka you. Modern day scientists have been examining a skeleton that was found from 3,000 years ago where the foot of a woman was cut off as punishment for committing a criminal act. Various clues hint that the woman's foot was cut off as a U. Her bones show no signs of any disease that could have made such an amputation necessary, and it seems that the injury was roughly made, rather than with the precision of a medical amputation. There were variations in punishments in different periods where the choice of foot removed depended on the severity of the crimes committed. Amputation of the right foot for a very serious crime, and the left for lighter offenses. It would seem that the woman, who was determined to be in her early 30s when she died, had committed the former. There is extensive historical evidence of the practice of the third punishment, such as documents of a Chinese official in the millennial BC complaining about the demand to find special shoes for their amputee people. Remove the reproductives. It's called gong, the permanent removal of a person's reproductive function. Male victims of this punishment were castrated, losing the member as well as their boys. A very famous casualty it was Sima Qian, a Damascus father of traditional Chinese history writing. Gong punishments for female victims were harder as in the older times they didn't really know what was going on all up in there or how to access it. So it might have involved pounding a woman's abdomen with a stout stick to introduce some kind of damage to the womb. Call that waka womb I guess? But um, no? No, all right. Then the final in the code, the last of the five punishments was death, obviously. However, there were different variations of death, from simple strangulation or decapitation to boiling or grilling a person alive and making literal mincemeat out of a person's flesh and then salting it. They got gorgeous with it, guys. The cruelty was deliberate and designed to cause maximum pain to the victims and their families, as well as to shock and deter others from committing similar crimes. A criminal might be sentenced to death by strangulation if left Less punitive or decapitation if more punitive. Strangulation was actually prescribed sentence for lesser crimes, lodging an accusation against one's parents or grandparents, scheming to kidnap a person and sell them, opening a coffin while desecrating a tomb. Decapitation was a method of execution prescribed for more serious crimes such as treason or sedition. Despite a great discomfort involved, most of the Chinese people actually preferred strangulation to decapitation in the ancient times, and this is the result of the 
traditional belief that the body is a gift from the parents and that it is therefore disrespectful to one's ancestors to die without returning one's body to the grave intact. Executions were usually carried out at 11.30 a.m. on the day of the execution. The convict would be carted from the jail cell to the execution grounds. The cart stopped at a wine shop named the Broken Bowl on the east side of the Zuanwu Gate, where the convict would be offered a bowl of rice wine. The bowl would be smashed after it was drunk, opa, and then her heads chopped off and promptly sent to the emperor. Now finished with the five official punishments, let's check out some other whores, like the kangu, a type of large wooden collar placed around the necks of offenders, which could weigh differently depending on the severity of their crimes. Speaking of which, the Chinese Empire really said, and we have the receipts for it too guys, as the criminals past crimes would be attached to the wooden collar, most of the time for the public to see, grocery list style. The kangu also restricted a person's movements, so it was common for people wearing kangus to start starved to death as they were unable to feed themselves and sometimes not even move from one place. If people were generous enough to offer food to the roadside kangoo wearers, they could also see the list of their crimes and determine based off of that if they deserved their generosity at all. After all, it was a device used for public humiliation and corporal punishment. Imagine seeing someone you've beefed with forever pop up one day on the street corner wearing one of these. You can just walk up and read everything they did wrong, just attach to them. That's satisfaction for a grudge Older man. Stand your ground until you can't anymore, the neck tower. This torture and execution was done in two ways, either in a tall narrow tower or in a tall wooden frame box. Either way, both tower or box could open only from the bottom side. A prisoner is put inside the wooden box frame or tower with only the neck protruding. Hands and feet would be shackled inside and only a towering pile of stones would be in there to stand on. However, each day, a stone or two is removed dropping the prisoner lower and lower and lower by inches over the days, letting them die slowly by strangulation. Battle of the sexes with this torture, it's Zanzi, a form of crushing torture used to extract confessions or as a penalization for laws broken. Now may be a fun time to mention that the five laws of punishment I had just counted for you guys, those punishments actually only apply to men. For women, the five punishments are a different set and far less severe. First is grinding grain, second is the Zanzi, which you're about to learn about, third punishment is beating, fourth is confinement, but also sometimes as mentioned she got her womb smacked about a little, and finally five, permission to take your own life. Not them killing you or telling you to do, no 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 no. This was some like side eye, well we're not telling you what to do, but you know what's up, dot 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 type of thing. Anyways, the Zanzi. This finger crusher was a Chinese instrument of torture consisting of small sticks strung together with cords which was then placed around the fingers and gradually pulled causing agonizing pain inwards. Think being tricked into playing knuckle breaker by your older brother for the first time. Under traditional Chinese law, a person could not be convicted of a crime unless they confessed. The Zanzi was a legal and non-lethal torture method for forcing women to confess and for men there was a similar and more painful Jiagun ankle crusher, which uses three yard long wooden planks that slowly pulled and compressed the feet in an excruciating fashion that both broke tendon and bone. Time to snap match that waist ancient china style, the waist chop. Waist chopping first appeared in the Zhou dynasty and sadly no, it was not truly a plastic surgery alternative to get that slim thick sama look going. In reality it's when a prisoner is tied to a table, whether lengthwise or widthwise it doesn't matter, however it's definitely far less comfortable to be chopped in half while also awkwardly dangling your arms and legs off of a table. Anyways, lying face down, the executioner was to try, try being the key word to sever the person in half using a large fodder knife at the small of the back. These big ass knives were literally so heavy it was more like teetering forward and letting the blade kind of slam into the person and hoping for the best. Sometimes, most times, the chopping was not limited to one blow. A story from 1734 describes Yu Hong Tu, the education administrator of Henan, was sentenced to a waist chop. After being cut into at the waist, he remained alive long enough to write the Chinese character Chen, which means cruel, seven times with his own blood before dying. After hearing this, the young Zheng Emperor abolished this form of execution. I guess maybe after learning what happened to Hong Tu, the Emperor felt like half the man he used to be too. Huh? 
Yeah. We've heard it. We've heard of it before. We'll hear of it again. It's Ling Chi, aka slow slicing, a regular torture and execution to reoccur in Bumblebee videos due to how far spread this torture traveled, how much it was used, and just how overall disturbing it is. Slow slicing, also known as death by a thousand cuts, was a form of torture and execution used in China from roughly 900 CE up until the practice ended around the early 1900s. The process involved tying the condemned prisoner to a wooden frame, usually in a public place. The flesh was then cut from the body in multiple slices in a process that was not specified in detail in Chinese law and therefore likely varied per empire or century. Generally it consists of cuts to the arms, then the legs and chest leading to the amputation of the limbs, followed by decapitation or a stab to the heart. If the criminal was less serious or the uh, executioner more merciful, the first cut would be to the throat. The punishment worked on three levels, as a form of public humiliation, as a slow and lingering death, and as a punishment after death. To be cut into pieces meant that the body of the victim was not whole in the spiritual life after death, which is massively consequential to many Chinese people who believed reincarnation required being whole in death. It is described as a fast process lasting no longer than 15 to 20 minutes. The coup de grace was all the more certain when the family could afford a bribe to have the stab to the heart inflicted first. Some emperors ordered three days of cutting, while others may have ordered specific tortures before the execution for a long longer execution. For example, records show that during Yan Chohan's execution, Yan was heard shouting for a half a day before his death. And finally, the nine degrees of punishment are ten shades of effed up. In the words of Mulan's Mushu, alright that's it, dishonor, dishonor on your whole family, make a note of this, dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow. Well the Qin Dynasty and a few others of China really felt this sentiment with their whole chest and it shows in the creation of the nine degrees. See the punishment in involved the execution of close and extended family members. These included the criminal's living parents, the criminal's living grandparents, any children the criminal may have over a certain age, which varied depending on the time period and who was in control and what their definition of a child even was. Also siblings and siblings-in-laws, uncles of the criminal as well as their spouses, and of course the criminal himself. Imagine messing up so bad your whole family line just gets annihilated. We all have that cousin or sibling who would have screwed all of us by now if this still happened. A famous documentation of the Nine Degrees is the story of Fang, a Confucian scholar famous for his loyalty to the Emperor Zhao Wen. When the Emperor is absurd and Fang is asked by the new one to write an inaugural address, well, Fang refuses. It's also ancient China, so realistically he knows exactly what refusal means so that proves how metal his decision was. Even when threatened with family extermination, Fang showed his IDGAF attitude and is reported saying never mind nine agnates, go ahead with ten. Blowing steam out the ears, the emperor says, bet. And so Fang becomes perhaps the only case of extermination of 10 agnates in the history of China. So quite literally, in addition to his own execution, the blood relations from all nine branches of his family hierarchy were killed. And as a kick to the nuts, his students and peers were added to be the 10th group. Random people unrelated to him who just happened to attend his lectures or work with the guy. Although altogether, 873 people are said to have been executed. Because this guy refused to write a speech and when threatened said, do it bro, I dare you. Before death, Fang was forced to watch his brother's execution and then Fang himself was executed by waist cutting. And legend goes that prior to his death, he dipped his finger in his own blood and wrote on the ground the Chinese character Kwan, which means upsurper. Man was petty until the end and took 873 people with him to prove it. Also, they liked writing in blood a lot.